Alright, so let's walk through the British colonial period review. Um, I'm going to go through it just as though I am a student in my class. So I'm going to put my name. Um, let's say I'm in period three. And here I am on the first set of questions. So first thing, if you remember, in our study is consider the source. So you have two different visuals here to study. The one on the left source says a view of Boston Harbor. I see ships, I see fancy buildings in the harbor, um, looks like people on the shore maybe doing some trading. Then I see the other visual, source, life of George Washington, the farmer. Washington standing among enslaved African American field workers harvesting grain. His Virginia home, Mount Vernon, in the background. So, I know the source. I have Boston Harbor in the New England colonies, and then I have George Washington's plantation in the southern colonies. Now, I need to consider the questions. Based on these two images, what claim is most accurate? And my second question, which of the following most likely led to the situation depicted in the image on the left? It's specifying view of Boston Harbor. So let's read through our options and see what we can either eliminate or if something jumps right out at us. First choice on question one. Based on these two images which claim is most accurate? Choice one. Large plantations growing tobacco and cotton were common in both New England and the southern colonies. Mm, if I go back to the visuals, I can notice here, and I'll take notes in my notebook, saying that Boston Harbor has a whole lot more to do with shipping And if I'm to look at the people, doesn't necessarily show anything that would depict slaves. Whereas with the life of George Washington, not only does it show slaves, it mentions them in the description. Enslaved African American field workers. So it is not large plantations growing tobacco in common were common in both New England and the southern colonies. Again, you got to read carefully because this throws New England in there and that's not what's shown in the Boston Harbor image. Choice two. Colonial settlements did not vary much. All settlers lived in villages that grew into large cities. Again, go back to the pictures. You have an urban setting on the left, you have a rural setting on the right. So it's obvious that not everything becomes urban. And our lifestyle today, we know better than that. There are still rural areas today. Three, colonial economies varied by region, depending on the geographic conditions. Not only should this stand out to you from your note-taking as the correct answer, but you're going to see that between these two images, there are, and I'm changing colors intentionally, big differences between these two images. But let's read that last option just to be sure. Shipbuilding anchored the economy in northern and southern colonies. Much like the first option about large plantations, if I go back, you're going to notice 
that there are two very different views of things. Shipping, urban versus rural, and if I was to make this other note that I didn't specify before, plantation. These are the things that you're going to notice and therefore we can go back and say that that is our correct answer. Now our second question asks us ignore the George Washington, ignore the plantation, ignore the cash crop economy. Focus on the merchants shipping in New England economy as depicted in the left which the following most likely led to the situation depicted in the image on the left which is the view of Boston Harbor. Our first option British settlers imported wood from England to build large ships in Boston. Although that is not something that you can answer by looking at the images you should know that in colonial history there is a ton of harvesting of the forest for economic activity right here in the American colonies. So this is something you can quickly say, no, they were not importing wood, they were getting it here. Second, the British army invaded Boston to claim it from the Spanish Empire. Again, this is not something that you can look over at the photos and know but rather something that you would know by saying, well, geez, the Spanish, if I remember Mr. Baker's lectures, he said that the Spanish were mostly in Central and South America, and it was only the British and French in North America. And Boston is in North America, so nope, the Spanish were never in North America, let alone Boston, so nope, I can eliminate this one too. The third, naturally deep water, and a sheltered harbor encouraged colonists to settle in Boston. Ah, this sounds a whole lot like something Mr. Baker said in one of his lectures about how not only did New England have poor soil, but they had deep water and harbors, natural harbors. I remember him saying that. Yes, this must be the correct answer. But let's be sure by reading the last. Colonial settlers excavated the shallow beach to create Boston Harbor. Well, no, actually that's the opposite of what Mr. Baker taught us. So yes, we know this is the correct answer. So these are the kinds of SQD or squid, whatever you want to call it, document analysis strategies that you can use in order to complete these practice questions for homework every night. And for a review like we're doing right now. Right here I can tell you I am very confident that it is most likely that people didn't read this passage. You simply didn't read it or you scanned over it quickly. And sometimes you can get away with that. You're not often going to get away with that. So again I will stress follow the squid process. If you try to scan over this in order to answer the questions, i telling you, you will end up spending more time trying to find a correct answer than if you simply followed the squid process like I teach you. So you can see here the source. That's our first step. Joshua L. Rosenblum, The Colonial American Economy, published in 2018. Economics Working Papers from the Department of Economics at Iowa State University. Yeah, that doesn't tell me a whole lot, other than it's going to be about the American economy during the colonies. So there's no famous name or anything jumping out at me. So now, what are the questions? What's going to be asked of me? Which claim is best supported by the evidence in this document? And a historian's best use of this document would be as. So let's go to this document itself and analyze it together. If I consider those questions, 
that were just asked of me. While reading this document, certain things are going to stand out to me. So let's one more time read these questions. Which claim is best supported by the evidence in this document? Geez, maybe I do want to read the options before going ahead. This isn't going to be uh, all that common, but occasionally you do want to read the options first. And then the second question, a historian's best use of this document would be as. So it seems anyway that this second question is going to be a lot like the first batch of questions on the first stimulus, which was the two images, that maybe this isn't going to be directly linked to the document itself. Maybe this is going to be something I have to think of on my own. But let's read the options for question three. Which claim is best supported by the evidence in this document? Notice I haven't read the document yet. Climatic conditions, choice of export crop, and pursuit of profit combined to determine a colony's labor system. Option two. The labor system of the British North American colonies depended solely on personal preferences of the people who settled there. Option three, labor systems were determined by the laws of each colony as well as the religion of its predominant group of settlers. And lastly, the labor force exerted a strong influence on the structure of each colony's labor. So if I read through these, three of them are about labor. One is about the climate. Hmm. It almost instinctually says that maybe it's the one that's standing out right now, but I should still look at the document to be sure. Now, my last step, I can read the document. In the southern colonies, climatic conditions were conducive to the cultivation of crops that found lucrative markets in Europe. In the low country of South Carolina and coastal Georgia, early colonists discovered that conditions were favorable for the cultivation of rice. As a result, rice was grown mainly on relatively large plantations, and colonists in coastal South Carolina and Georgia relied heavily on slave labor to provide an adequate workforce. So if I'm to do some highlighting here, or underlining, I could say, oh geez, I already see that term, climatic conditions, that was used before. And here again, conditions were favorable. Hmm. Now it does mention slave labor later, so I should probably highlight that. Let's keep going. The climate of the northern colonies more closely resembled that of Northwest Europe. There's that word climate again. Limiting export opportunities. Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York nonetheless supported the development of small farms raising livestock and growing wheat and other grains. Flour produced in the region found markets in southern Europe and the West Indies. Hmm, okay. So I'm seeing that term climate again. Let's keep going. Reflecting the greater complexity of regional trading relationships, the northern colonies developed dense and relatively sophisticated merchant communities that helped to organize and finance regional and international trade and provide shipping services. By the late colonial period, Boston, New York, and Philadelphia had become bustling urban centers. The largest, Philadelphia, had over 30,000 residents in 1775, while New York had 25,000 and Boston 16,000. In comparison, Charleston, the only significant urban center in the South, had a population of just 12,000. Hmm. I don't see a whole lot in there that tells me much of anything in terms of climatic conditions or labor. So this last paragraph, hmm, yeah, it doesn't really tell me a whole lot.
Now, that doesn't mean don't completely read documents, because guess what? Sometimes the answer is going to be towards the very end. But let's go back to our question now. Which claim is best supported? Climatic conditions, choice of export crop, and pursuit of profit combined to determine a colony's labor system. Hmm. I think I'm going to choose that one. I could always change it, but... Next, the labor system of the British North American colonies depended solely on personal preferences of the people who settled there. Hmm. I don't think it really said anything about people's preferences. Labor systems were determined by the laws of each colony as well as the religion of its predominant group of settlers. Religion wasn't even mentioned at all in the document. And last, the labor force exerted a strong influence on the structure of each colony's labor system. Hmm. No, I think it's climatic conditions. So our gut instinct was correct. But that's not always going to be the case, so just make sure that you are still reading a document and highlighting and underlining and making notes. A historian's best use of this document would be as a fictional account of how colonial American economies might have worked. Well, if I go back, the sourcing information sounds like a pretty formal history book. It's from a Department of Economics at Iowa State University. That sounds pretty official. I'm going to say that's not fictional. A record of recent research findings about colonial American economies. Hmm. Well, again, let's go back to the sourcing information. Oh, recent. 2018, that's pretty recent. So maybe it is recent research findings. The third, documentary evidence of differences among colonial regions. Hmm, that could be it. Last, evidence of how colonial settlers understood economic theories. Mm, I think I can throw that one away because I don't think colonial settlers were all that interested in economic theories. They were just interested in making a living. But we have two here, both of which sound like they could be correct. A record of recent research findings about colonial American economies or documentary evidence of differences among colonial regions. So this is about the differences among regions. And the document was dated relatively recently. Ah, I know the difference. Documentary evidence. Documentary means television. This was a written document. That means this is a record of recent research findings. Questions 5 and 6 deal with these two documents. One is a written narrative. One is a visual. And let's consider the sourcing information of these documents before we move on to trying to answer the questions. So you have the first written narrative document, the second visual, both of them include sourcing information. So let's consider that sourcing information. First, the source is Slavery for Historical Statistics of the United States, Millennial Edition, by Stanley Angerman and Richard Such and Gavin Wright. And this is published pretty recently in 2003. And this is obviously a book because it's a narrative and our second document on the other hand sold to go south from the suppressed book about slavery gw carlton and company oh 1864 so that's published actually in the middle of the civil war when the controversy over slavery is very very heated obviously we're at war so let's go back and consider the questions that are going to be asked of us. So, based on both documents 1 and 2, which is most likely responsible for the action shown in document 2, sold to go south, drawing? Then, number 6, which statement best describes a result 
of the historical events referenced in documents 1 and 2. Seeing that word result makes me think number 5 probably deals directly with the documents. Number 6 asks us to do a little bit more deeper thinking beyond the documents. So let's go back now that we know what to focus on and go through the documents. Let's start with the written document. By 1619, slavery had been on the decline in England. Interesting. Decline. In 1664, however, Maryland declared that all blacks held in the colony and all those imported as slaves in the future would serve for life, as would their children and later generations. Interesting. So in 1664, the Serve for Life Declaration is made. Virginia's policy became equally clear by the end of that decade. As of 1690, blacks constituted less than 15% of the population in Virginia and Maryland, reflecting the fact that for the first two generations of Chesapeake tobacco, labor was primarily supplied by white indentured servants. Interesting. So 1690, blacks, less than 15% of the population, labor primarily supplied by white indentured servants. Between 1690 and 1710, the pattern radically changed. Okay, pattern radically changed. Terms like radically changed sound really important. The primary forces may be identified as rising scarcity in the supply of white indentured servants, changes to laws forcing African slaves to be enslaved for life, and booming demand for Chesapeake tobacco after 1700. Okay, well, we already heard about indentured servants. We already heard about enslaved for life, but this is a new development here at the very end about booming demand for Chesapeake tobacco after 1700 and booming demand for cotton after the early 1800s. Interesting. So we've annotated this. Now let's take a look at the visual before going back and trying to answer question five, which is based on both of these things. You see here, sold to go south. So this is a slave auction. You can see here people on their knees begging these white folks here to not sell them, it probably looks like. You see another black man over here whose hands are behind his back. He has likely got his hands tied. So you have a slave auction, people being sold into slavery, all while needing to consider what is in the first written document. So let's go back to the questions. Based on both document 1 and 2, which is most likely responsible for the action shown in document 2, selling of slaves? Okay, so first, first option. Increased 18th century demand for tobacco grown in the Chesapeake region of the U.S. Okay, that, that was mentioned. The decline of the institution of slavery in England by the early 17th century, well, obviously that's not it, because it's talking about how slavery increased after, yes, it had declined for a little bit, but it actually increased. So, next, increased demand for white indentured servants in the southern states. Well, actually, it mentioned how white indentured servants were getting harder to come by, and then increase 19th century demand for cotton grown in the deep southern U.S. Okay, so let's see. We have two very similar sounding answers. The middle two choices here can be eliminated. We already decided that. So what would be the difference between the 18th and 19th century? 18th century in tobacco, 19th century in cotton. Let's go back to the documents. And let's see here, how does it explain 
what's going on in document 2. Well, you're also going to notice in the sourcing information 1864. And 1864 is long after cotton became the main crop of the South, not tobacco. Now, this is something you might not be super familiar with yet at this point in the course because most of what we've learned about has more to do with tobacco being the primary crop. But as the course goes on, we're going to learn more and more about the slave system in the United States and how it transitions in the South anyway from growing tobacco to growing cotton. So I'm going to, based on this date again, 1864, go back to the questions and decide that this has much more to do with cotton growth than it does tobacco growth. And then document six asks us, and I'm going to assume, like I said before, this is going to ask us to go a little deeper than what's in the documents. So, which statement best describes a result of the historical events referenced in documents one and two? First, southern planters began to cultivate tobacco during the 18th century. Well, that is true, but that's not a result of the historical events. That's like one of the historical events, so that's not it. Generations of people with African ancestry were legally subjected to lifetime enslavement. That sounds like it could be it, but let's read the others just to be sure. Southern planters relied more heavily on white indentured servants to produce cotton. That's definitely false. You go back to the wording here and it says that labor transitioned from white indentured servants to lifelong slaves. And last, white indentured servants increasingly joined with black workers to fight for their rights. Definitely not true. Nobody's fighting for their rights at this time because you can be horribly abused by your owner if you do that. So let's go with that. Generations of people with African ancestry were legally subjected to lifetime enslavement. So questions 7 and 8 on the documents below and on your knowledge of social studies. So one and two. They're, they're both written and then we have these questions to go with it. So let's analyze the documents first. So the documents, let's look at the sourcing information. We have the first, which is the Magna Carta. That's a pretty significant document. You probably remember that from global history with Mr. Miller and the year 1215, that's long before the British American colonies and long before the revolution, etc. The other, let's see, Emily Arendt et al. So that means at all, if you don't know, that means there's more than one author at all. So this woman, Emily Arendt, and other authors wrote Colonial Society in the American Yop. That must be a journal. Oh yes, from Stanford University Press. So that's a journal published by Stanford University Press in 2018. So you have old school documents and you have a journal article from today. So that's something to take into consideration. Now before reading the documents, however, let's go back and consider what the questions are asking us. So, number seven, which claim is best supported by both documents? Oh geez, it sounds like maybe we actually want to read these options before we go back to the document itself. But let's check out eight, what's asking, or what's being asked of us there. According to these documents, a key difference between political institutions in England and its colonies centered around... Oh, wow, so both of these sound like they're going to come directly from the documents, so that's cool. That means one isn't going to ask for deeper thinking. It sounds like both come from the documents. So number eight, we don't need to read the options just yet because it says look for a key difference. Okay, so I'm going to look for a key difference between political institutions in England and its colonies. 
But number seven, let's read the options because it says which claim is best supported. We actually kind of have to have in the back of our mind the different claims in order to consider it. So first option, colonial political institutions failed to represent the interests of colonial inhabitants. Hmm, okay. Colonial political institutions were influenced by both English legal tradition and colonial experience. Okay. Colonial political institutions were not influenced by English legal traditions. Okay. And lastly, colonial political institutions guaranteed suffrage for all adults who lived in the colonies. Let's consider those while we go back and analyze the documents. Let's read over the Magna Carta first. Clause 14. To obtain the general consent for a tax in Great Britain, England, we will cause the Great Council, made up of men who represent the people of England, to be summoned individually by letter. They will come together on a fixed day and at a fixed place. The decision about creating or collecting taxes on that day will be made by a decision reached by vote of a majority rule of the representatives of the people the king shall follow the will of the great council the king shall not raise or levy taxes on his own accord okay so in order to raise taxes you gotta have majority rule of the representatives of the people okay now let's go to the next document still keeping those things that we just read in mind. Consumption, trade, and slavery drew the colonies closer to Great Britain. Okay, so that's a pretty important statement. But politics and government split them further. Interesting. Democracy in Europe more closely resembled oligarchies than republics with only elite members of society eligible to serve in elected positions. Okay, so Europe is much more about elite members of society. Most European states did not hold regular elections, with Britain and the Dutch Republic being the two major exceptions. However, even in these countries, only a tiny portion of males could vote. Okay, only a tiny portion of people can vote. This is all still referring to Europe. Now it's transitioning, it looks like, because it says, in the North American colonies, by contrast, meaning this is going to be different. Oh, go back to the questions. Number eight, a key difference. Okay, that should stand out to me. Glad I read the questions first. White male suffrage was far more widespread. Oh, so suffrage much more widespread. In addition to having great, greater population involvement, colonial government also had more power in a variety of areas. Assemblies and legislatures regulated business, imposed new taxes, cared for the poor in their communities, built roads and bridges, and made most decisions concerning education. Colonial Americans sued often, which in turn led to more power for local judges and more prestige in jury service. Oh. Thus, lawyers became extremely important in American society and in turn played a greater role in American politics. Okay. So, before going back to the questions, we've got the Magna Carta in 1215 talking about majority rule, the king shall not levy a tax without that vote from the representatives of the people. Our second document talks about how the colonies were close to Great Britain, but their governments actually kind of put them apart. In Europe, things were more about the elites. Only a tiny portion of people could vote, whereas in contrast, suffrage was much more widespread in the colonies. Okay, so now let's go back to our documents. So, let's start with seven. Which claim is best supported by both documents? 
Number one, colonial political institutions failed to represent the interests of colonial inhabitants. Well, that's not true. It was just talking about all the things that these uh, assemblies were capable of making decisions on, so that's a throwaway answer. Colonial political institutions were influenced by both English legal tradition and colonial experience. Hmm, that one sounds viable because there's a traditional English document, the Magna Carta, but also discussion of colonial experience in the second document. So let's, let's keep that one in mind. Let's read the others to make sure that this could be the right answer. Colonial political institutions were not influenced by English legal traditions. Well, that can't be true, or they wouldn't have included the Magna Carta for us to read, and it wouldn't have talked about things like majority rule. So no, that sounds wrong. Colonial political institutions guaranteed suffrage for all adults who lived in the colonies. Mm, I don't think that's what it said. It said that more people had suffrage, but it didn't say that it was universal. So yes, let's go with the one that sounded the best. Colonial political institutions, institutions were influenced by both English legal tradition and colonial experience. Yes, let's go with that. Number eight, according to these documents, a key difference between political institutions in England and its colonies centered around, first, who had the authority to raise taxes from the people, second, the scope and variety of powers held by their representative bodies, third, the percentage by which a law could be passed in the representative bodies, and last, the age at which a man was entitled to vote in elections. Hmm. So I don't think it's authority to raise taxes from the people because that's only mentioned in one of the documents. Scope and variety of powers, that could be because it talks about only raising of taxes in the Magna Carta, whereas it talks about a variety of things in the other. The third was the percentage by which a law could be passed. I don't think they talked about specific numbers. So that one we can get rid of. And last, the age at which a man was entitled to vote in elections. No, they said more people were eligible, but they didn't say why. So let's go with the scope and variety of powers held by their representative bodies. Okay, so let's take a look at the next batch of questions, 9 and 10, based on this document here. Let's first annotate the document by first, of course, looking at the sourcing information. Emily Arendt at All Colonial Society. Stanford University Press, so this looks like maybe it's an academic journal, and 2018. Now, we need to go back before reading the document and read what's going to be asked of us from this document. Question 9. What evidence best supports the claim about colonial society made by the historian in this excerpt. Hmm. Which evidence best supports? So it almost sounds like we need to read these options before answering that question. And number 10, which statement best reflects the claim made by the historian in this excerpt? Okay. Reflects the claim, best supports the claim. No, I think we could do that without reading the options first. So let's go back and continue annotating our document. So as this Emily Arendt Colonial Society document reads, an elected assembly was an offshoot of the idea of civic duty. The notion that men had a responsibility to support and uphold the government through voting paying taxes, and service in the militia. Americans firmly accepted the idea of a social contract, 
the idea that government was put in place by the people. Philosophers such as Thomas Hobbes and John Locke pioneered this idea. And there is evidence to suggest that these writers influenced the colonists. While in practice, elites controlled colonial politics, in theory, many colonists believed in the notion of equality before the law and opposed special treatment for any members of colonial society. So now let's go back and look at our questions again. Number nine. Which evidence best supports the claim about colonial society made by the historian in this excerpt? First, the existence of elected assemblies such as the House of Burgesses in the colony of Virginia. That sounds viable because they were talking about assemblies. Next, the diversity of religious practices among residents of the British North American colonies. No, I think we can eliminate that. They didn't really say much of anything about religion. Third option, the large number of French settlers living in the British North American colonies. Hmm, no, they never mentioned the French. And last option, the predominance of indentured servitude as a system of labor in the British North American colonies. Yeah, they didn't talk about labor either, so this one pretty easy one now that I've analyzed all the options. They're talking about elected assemblies in the document and mentioning elected assemblies in that option. So next, number 10. Which statement best reflects the claim made by the historian in this excerpt? First, most American colonists believed that elites were best suited to govern. Hmm. They did mention elites being members of those assemblies. So we can take this into consideration. Second, equality before the law is a concept that originated in 18th century colonial America. Hmm. I don't think so because actually I remember back to one of these previous documents and the Magna Carta, which says some things that would sound a lot like this is way older than the 18th century so they were thinking about these things in Britain way before the 18th century third enlightenment thinkers influence colonists to believe in special treatment for elites no it, not at all enlightenment thinkers if you remember John Locke they were talking about power to the people and they meant all people not just elites and last option, belief in equality before the law was widespread in colonial America despite its social and political inequality. So we eliminated the middle two. Let's reread these other two, the first and last choice. First choice, most American colonists believed that elites were best suited to govern. They did mention elites in the government. Let's read this one. Belief Inequality before the law was widespread in colonial America despite its social and political inequality. I think we can eliminate the first option because although they did mention that elites were in charge but that all citizens felt civic duty was important. So let's go with this last belief in equality before the law was widespread in colonial America despite its social and political inequality. Okay, so let's go to questions 11 and 12 based on this written document. Here's our questions. Let's first annotate the document. Let's start with the sourcing information, of course. The Maryland Toleration Act of 1649. Okay. So, this is in Maryland. Toleration means treating each other reasonably and fairly, and it's 1649. Okay, so now let's go look at what's going to be asked of us. A historian would best use this document as 
and 12 is this document most likely led to which result? Okay, so how would a historian use this document and what resulted from this document? All right, let's go back, finish annotating. So let's read this excerpt from the Maryland Toleration Act now. And be it also further enacted by the same authority that whatsoever person or persons shall declare, call, or denominate any person for pers or persons whatsoever within this province, an heretic, schismatic, idolater, Puritan, independent, Presbyterian, Popish priest, Jesuit, Jesuited Papist, Lutheran, Calvinist, Anabaptist, Brownist, Antinomian, Barrowist, Roundhead, Separatist, or any other name or term in a reproachful, which means disrespectful, manner relating to matter of religion, shall for every such offense forfeit and lose the sum of ten shillings. Okay, so they're going to lose ten shillings for disrespectful talk about religion. So ten shillings sterling, or the value thereof to be levied on the goods and chattels of every such offender and offenders. The one half thereof to be forfeited and paid unto the person and persons of whom such reproachful words are or shall be spoken or uttered, and the other half thereof to the Lord Proprietary and his heirs, lords, and proprietaries of this province. So this is all really fancy sounding language. You might see this document, and without learning the strategies we have in class to properly analyze it and annotate it and pull from it what we need, you could say, oh my gosh, there's no way I'm going to get the right answer. This is way too difficult. And I think we've pulled from this what we need, that they really didn't like people bad-mouthing each other's religion, so much so that if you did, you'd have to pay 10 shillings and a fine for bad-mouthing someone's religion. So, number 11. A historian would best use this document as evidence of the punitive nature of colonial laws in Maryland, uh, I don't think so. Punitive almost sounds like this isn't very punitive in comparison, like paying a fee is preferable to prison time or a flogging, which was a public whipping. So I don't know if punitive is a word I would use to describe this. So I'm going to say no on that. Evidence of colonial support for the democratic principle of religious tolerance. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and click that, actually. I think that stands right out. Let's, let's make sure we are sure about this, though. Evidence of intolerance of religious worship and colonial law. No, actually, this is all about tolerance, not intolerance. And last, the existence of a unified religious community in colonial America. No way it's not unified, because they listed about 4 million different religions all in that document. Awesome, so this one stood right out for us. Great. Notice we were able to get what we needed from the document, even though the fancy language is there. Number 12, this document most likely led to which result? Conversion of thousands of Maryland residents from Catholicism to Protestantism? No, I don't think so. This wasn't promoting one religion over another. Second, forfeiture of English citizenship by religious residents of Maryland? No, I, I, I don't think it was talking about citizenship at all. Third, the thriving of a variety of religious communities in the colony of Maryland. That sounds right. There were a lot of different religions named. Let's check the last one, but I think this might be it. Last, forced exile of members of Protestant religious domination, denominations from Maryland. No, because this was about toleration, not forced exile or anything punitive like that. So let's go with the thriving of a variety of religious communities. So 13 through 15, three questions deal with this. 
this document. So 13 and 14 will fit on the screen here, and then we'll scroll down to C15 when needed. But let's start by sourcing this document. This is from the Declaration of Independence in 1776. So that should be helpful to us. So the three questions ask us. Number 13, all of the following British policies are inferred in the above selection except... Okay, so there's going to be some things in the document which one is there and which one is not, or which ones are there and there's only one that's not. Number 14, why were the complaints of the colonists not further voiced before 1760? Okay, and 15, what point of view did Britain have concerning colonial representation in Parliament? Let's go back and annotate the document. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. Okay, so to prove, they're going to use facts. All right. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states for that purpose obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither, and raising the conditions of new appropriations of land. So, this sounds like they want to limit migrations. So, limit migration and making it harder to get land, raising the conditions of new appropriations of land. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our Constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation. Okay, so rule is foreign to our Constitution for quartering large bodies of armed troops among us, for protecting them by a mock trial, from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states. So, mock trial from punishment, protecting. For cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, and for posing taxes without our consent. Okay, let's go back to our questions. So, what policies? Navigation acts were preventing British citizens from trading with anybody but the British Empire. So that would be the not allowing trade. They did mention that. Proclamation of 1763. Yes, they did mention this because remember, they made it harder to settle land. The Stamp Act. Yep, they mentioned taxes and writs of assistance. Yep, it's writs of assistance. Remember, we learned in class, writs of assistance is like a search warrant that can be used at any time for any reason by a British soldier, and that was not mentioned. 14. Why were the complaints of the colonists not further voiced before 1760? Hmm. This sounds like we need to know more than just be on the document because the document was written in 1776 and it's referencing what's going on at the time. So yeah, this is something we're going to need to know more than just what's in the document. So let's read our options. A time period of salutary neglect kept opinions loyal to Britain. Yeah, that sounds right. If you remember, salutary neglect means Britain left the colonists alone to rule themselves, to run their own economies. Yep, 
Okay, so they didn't have complaints until more rules came along. Yup, sounds like salutary neglect. Let's check the other options just to be sure. Freedom of speech was denied in the colonies. It didn't mention that in the document. Opposition party members were sent west of the Appalachian Mountains to French territory. Actually, no, the document said that it was harder to access land. And if you remember, the proclamation line was specifically do not go west of the Appalachian Mountains. And last, revolutionaries planned their actions in secret. Yeah, they did, but they didn't really have any complaints until the added rules. So yes, it is absolutely salutary neglect. When you see a question like this, why were there fewer complaints before 1760? Or more likely, 1763, the end of the French and Indian War. Why were there not complaints until then? Because of salutary neglect. Hands down, that's always going to be your answer. Number 15, what point of view did Britain have concerning colonial representation in Parliament? They believed the colonists were already virtually represented. Yeah, they did think that the colonists could be taken into consideration by Parliament back in Europe. But let's read the others just to be sure. They viewed the colonists as foreign as a foreign legislative body. No. No, no, no. Everybody considered themselves a British citizen. So this is not correct. They did not believe colonists to be the subjects of the British crown. Uh, no. The British crown thought everyone in the British Empire was their subject. So this is absolutely not true. And last, they believed the hundreds of colonial diplomats already in Britain were sufficient. Well, there were not that many diplomats in Britain. There's like a colonial governor for each colony, and that's about it. So, and soldiers to keep the peace. So, by process of elimination, even though it was a little bit unsure, we're able to narrow it down to here. Okay, so let's see what we got next. Questions 16 and 17, based on this written document. Get our questions up on the screen. Now let's do some analysis of the document. Okay, sourcing information. Resolutions by Patrick Henry in the Virginia House of Burgesses, 1765. Okay, we got a primary source on our hands. It's from the actual time period. So now let's go back and read our questions. The main purpose of this resolution was to, and based on this document, which statement best describes the author's point of view? So we're looking for the author's point of view and the purpose of the resolution. So now let's go back and read. Resolved that the taxation of the people by themselves, or by persons chosen by themselves to represent them, who can only know what taxes the people are able to bear, or the easiest method of raising them, and must themselves be affected by every tax laid on the people, is the only security against burdensome taxation, and the distinguishing characteristic of British freedom, without which the ancient constitution cannot exist. Without having annotated or highlighted anything. I'm going to make note to myself that this is a document complaining about British taxes. So now let's go back to the questions again. So the main purpose of the resolution was to protest against the proclamation of 1763. Nope, that was about settlement of land. Protest against the Stamp Act. Yep, that was a tax, so let's mark that, but let's read the rest just to be sure. Protest against the Boston Massacre. No, that has nothing to do with taxes. Protest against the Northwest Ordinance. Nope, that has nothing to do with taxes. So we've got the right answer there with Stamp Act. 
Number 17. Based on this document, which statement best describes the author's point of view? The British government would only have the right to tax the colonists if they were represented in Parliament. Hmm, that sounds like no taxation without representation. Okay, so that might be our right answer, but let's read the others just to be darn sure. The British North American colonists owe loyalty to the king and all its laws. No, Patrick Henry was definitely not pro-British crown. The British North American colonies should seek their independence from Britain. Mm, I don't think he's going that far. He's just complaining about taxes at this point. He's not asking for independence. And governments do not have the right to tax their citizens or subjects. No, if you read it, again, it was saying that there's rights to taxation, but they should be held only by certain parts of the government. So yes, we're going to go with our original. That sounded a whole lot like no taxation without representation. So questions 18 through 20 are based on this passage below. So it's a written document. Three questions, 18, 19, and 20. So let's first analyze the document. The written document, if we source it properly, says that it's Thomas Paine's Common Sense in 1776. This should be very familiar from your notes and let's go back and see what they want us to know about common sense. 18. The arguments presented in this passage was intended to... Okay, so what are the intentions of the argument? This document led to a turning point in history because... So that sounds like we got to know a little bit beyond the document because it's talking about it led to something. And then 20. Based on the passage which statement best describes Paine's point of view. So we need to think about Thomas Paine's point of view. We need to think about the intention of the argument and then a turning point because of it. So let's go back. Small islands not capable of protecting themselves are the proper objects for kingdoms to take under their care. But there is something very absurd and supposing a continent to be perpetually governed by an island. In no instance hath nature made the satellite larger than its primary planet. And, as England and America, with respect to each other, reverses the common order of nature, it is evident that they belong to different systems. England to Europe, America to itself. So let's go back and do our questions now. So the argument presented in this passage was intended to convince American colonists to declare their independence. Yep, I think that's correct. Let's, let's read all the others just to be sure. But if you remember, we very specifically learned that Thomas Paine wrote Common Sense specifically to convince colonists to declare their independence from Britain. So, provide a reason for ratification of the Constitution. That hasn't even happened in history yet. Urge colonists to accept the Albany Plan of Union. Nope, that has nothing to do with it. Persuade France to aid the United States in the Revolutionary War. The Revolutionary War hasn't started yet. So, good gut reaction on the first choice there. Number 19. This document led to a turning point in history because, so this is the one where we might need to think beyond the document, it led Paine's readers to support colonizing small, helpless islands. No. It led more American colonists to support declaring their independence from Britain. Aha. Uh -huh. It changed readers' understanding of geography. No. It led Americans to dominate Britain in international trade. No, Britain dominated international trade at this time. And our last question. Based on the passage, which statement best describes Paine's point of view? England had mistreated its American colonists. 
Well, we know that's the argument made in the declaration itself, so let's mark that, but let's finish reading this just to be sure. American colonists are not represented in English government. Mm, that's not what he's saying in the body of the document, though, although that was an argument made by colonists against Britain. So this is a tricky question, because that was an argument, but that's not what was in the document. The American colonists have failed to respect English authority. No, because we know he's actually arguing they shouldn't respect English authority. And last, England should not rule over its American colonies. Ah, that one sounds a whole lot. England should not rule over its American colonies. And yes. So, again, I almost got tricked into England has mistreated its American colonies. That sounded like a, a good answer. So did American colonists are not represented in the English government because those are two things that sound like anti-Britain arguments, but they don't have anything to do with the document. So this is one that almost tricked me, too. All right, let's check out our next batch of questions. Now, these questions are based on an image that should look familiar. So we have two questions. Let's first source the image. Paul Revere's Bloody Massacre on King Street, 1770. The Boston Massacre, as depicted in his drawing. So now let's go back. What's being asked of us? Which event is being depicted? Oh, well, that's an easy one. Okay, this is one of the few examples where I'm not going to have you read all the other options to be sure, because based on what we've done in class and how obvious that picture is and how much detail uh, it shows that that one's pretty easy. How about number 22? A historian would find this document most useful for... Now let's go back. Boston Massacre, Bloody Massacre, it's right there in the title, so geez, if you got that first question wrong I'd be pretty mad. But let's read the options for 22. How could a historian use this document? Studying the Northwest Ordinance? No, that hasn't happened in history yet. Studying colonial reactions to conflict with the British government? Ooh, that sounds good. The massacre was definitely a conflict. And studying the War of 1812? That hasn't even happened yet. We haven't learned that yet. And studying what happened during the event depicted? No, it's a still image. We can't really get a play-by-play -play of the event itself just by the still image. So this one, pretty easy for us to analyze that image, mainly because it's such a famous one. Our last couple questions here are based on another written passage. So let's analyze the document. Oh my goodness, there's no sourcing information for us. What are we going to do? Okay, well, let's skip to the next step. Read the questions. Which document includes this passage? Oh, okay, it wants us to know the document. That's why it didn't give it to us. This passage suggests that the authority of the government... Okay. What about the authority of the government? Okay, let's go back. Read through the document and annotate as we go. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety 
and happiness. I sure hope, much like the Boston Massacre, that you know, based on the wording, that that's the Declaration of Independence. The only other option here that we've even talked about, and we only talked about it for a nanosecond, is the May Mayflower Compact. Monroe Doctrine and Northwest Ordinance we haven't even talked about yet, so hopefully that one's pretty easy for you. And then this passage suggests that the authority of government includes the power to seize private property for national defense. Nope, that doesn't sound like anything from the document. Is based on a social contract meant to guarantee individual rights. Oh, interesting. Yeah, okay. That sounds a lot like what he was listing. Is the source of all the natural rights of citizens. No, 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 no. Founders believed that people had natural rights, the government had nothing to do with it. So the government certainly can't be the source of those natural rights. And the authority of the government originates from the divine right of kings? No way. They did not believe in monarchy having power over them. So that, I hope, helps you with your very first review. I'm not going to do this again in the future, but I'm really hoping that this kind of coaches you through how to highlight and underline and annotate and make notes and the SQD process of going through even these stimulus-based multiple choice questions, not only deeper document analysis like we do in class. And if you get really good at this process throughout the year, this will go faster and faster. I know this seemed painstakingly slow, but I really hope that this was helpful to you. If you have any questions, of course, reach out. Otherwise, I'll see you in class.